It's been a great day, but we have two more speakers uh, for our final panel. First, we have David Peterson, who is a corporate campaign manager at Provec. You've already heard that name mentioned. Uh, an international food awareness organization working for a more sustainable, humane, and healthy food system. He has a degree in philosophy and business management with a focus on entrepreneurship and future proteins. And we also have JC Reese, who is the research director at Sentience Institute, a nonprofit think tank, a tank uh, researching the most effective strategies to expand humanity's moral circle. And he ha also has an upcoming book, The End of Animal Farming. And he's also written for publications such as Quartz, Salon, and Vox, and has presented in uh, over uh, 20 countries. So he's well-traveled. <laughs> okay, and first we have David, please. Thank you, John. Thank you. It's always, always nice to have the, the graveyard shift, as we call it. Um, well, just two, two caveats, actually, to begin with. First off, I've been, it's been a pleasure. I've been going to a lot of conferences and I see a lot of presentations. And I really like this trend where people have a few slides and it's very beautiful and then a good story to eat and it's very pedagogical and, and very attainable. Unfortunately, I didn't get that memo. So it's gonna be like a very a spam of slides. I hope you'll bear with me. I'll also share them afterwards. But I, I really try to, to boil down. And second off, our, our talk here, our panel is called The Future of Animal Foods, and hopefully we'll get to that more in the discussion. I actually want to talk about the alternative and why there's a solid business case for plant-based protein. Okay, that's it. And first off, ProVeg International, as she mentioned, um, I was also set up a bit about the 50 by 40 that was mentioned earlier. So just briefly on that, I'm not going to get too much into it. But it's basically the idea is a global collaborative working from this theory called collective impact, moving the societal sectors from what's called isolated impact, where we kind of work and do each our own cool thing, and then coordinate efforts a lot more, especially around our food system. Just a fun, well, not fun, but an interesting fact is that the global uh, spending on climate change mitigation is $388 billion per year, more than a billion dollars per day, and that means that uh, out of you know, the 14.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions coming from our livestock sector at a conservative estimate, um, that's such a huge piece of the puzzle when you talk climate change, right? But out of the 388 billion, less than 1%, not, nothing near 14.5%, goes into reducing societal reliance on animal-based products. So there's a huge gap in policy as a mitigation tool towards climate change. And that's just for the climate change bu budget when it comes to food, right? There's also a lot more going in health spending and world food hunger. And going on a more plant-based diet can help solve a lot of those problems. So just to touch, touch on that briefly. But actually, I'll also just so just you know what we're about. Um, I started a year ago. I'm still learning all the stuff we do. So. Just really quick, network events talks, well, that would be this. Market research and information, a lot of what GFI also does. Development on ideas, yeah, let's keep that one abstract. We're also starting up a, an incubator in Berlin. We collaborate with academia and others. So, for example, we have this we're part of this coalition called Smart Pro. So that's a, a EU funded, I think it's 8 million euros on a five year period across the value chain to first researchers come up with cool um, proteins, as you've also heard earlier today. And then we're sort of the middleman in between getting it out to the companies to distribute and make products out of these. So we work across academia and a lot of other stuff. Ingredients consulting, sort of going behind the supply chains and, and replacing animal ingredients that can be very volatile in a, in a supply chain context with animal-based products and consumer market testing. We also have this V-label that you've seen on some of the products out there. So just a few of the things we do. I'm happy to talk more about that if we can help you in any way to promote more plant-based living. So quick overview. We'll be going through how we are now rethinking and redoing protein, and we'll be looking at these three traditional business cases around that. And I even cut, cut out the more global context on this, but that'll be it. And then, I, of course, I'll round up with a question for you guys. 
So I'd, li I'd like to invite you all to, to think about those two questions, actually. And I don't know if there's anyone who would like to take a shot at, let's say, the first one. What happens when a, when a drug, the patent on a drug runs out? Anyone familiar with that? Any guesses? A lot of people nodding, but no one. Generic drug, yes, everybody else will come in and they will start creating their own version of this, this product. The same when people who are very fond of IT, like this guy, when a software opens its source, everybody will start making their own, right? So for millennia, in, in mainstream thinking and also in the market, when we thought about protein, right, we thought about meat. So if there are any vegetarians in the house, they would always get this question, where do you get your protein? Um, but this is slowly changing. What I'll, I'll make a case for is that what, what has happened with when you open a computer program to source or when a patent on a drug runs out, for the purposes of public perception, five minutes already, okay, for, for purposes of public perception and from a market viewpoint, protein has gone open source. And I'll, I'll briefly describe what that means. So this is a... Um, from the meeting place, it's uh, 2016, the front cover of a magazine in the US for the meat industry. And it says basically the meat industry in America needs to become the protein industry. Don't talk about we're producing food, we're actually producing protein for a, a growing population. And Cargill, which is, was previously called Cargill Meat Solutions, changed the name to Cargill Protein Solutions. Have you ever had a company and you had to change the name? You know how annoying that is with all the emails and all the little things like this and all that. It, it's huge, especially when you have a company like that. And they're doing that to embrace this open source protein mindset. As you can also see, they invested in a clean meat company to start diversifying their protein supply chains. Beyond Meat, uh, now in the aisles, called the protein aisles, no longer the meat aisles in the supermarkets, so changing the way we think about it. Same over here in Sweden, they completely mixed it up. Uh, this is oatmeal that I found in one of my old roommates. Now it says protein oatmeal, you know, making it cooler and, and, and stronger. So the investment case, the FAIR initiative, they have a combined uh, investment portfolio of $8.7 trillion. That's a lot of money. And they started out in 2016 with $1.3 trillion. So that's quite a lot of more money they got in their investment portfolio. They went out to say to 16 global food companies that you put all your eggs in one basket when it comes to where you get your protein from, which is mainly factory farming. You need to start diversifying your protein supply chain. And this is super boring language, but it works with investors. And this is basically their report summing up their 28 ESG issues, environmental, social governance, a lot of things wrong with factory farming. From a purely business case, like don't only invest in that, it's bad business. So speaking of that, the business case, I just have a few quotes of cool people that are influential, like the Google chairman saying uh, plant-based protein is the way to go. You also know this guy saying 30 years, uh, maybe Jay-Z Reese has a different take on that. In 30 years, we don't need to kill animals for food. We'll have clean meat or cell-based meat and plant-based meat. So what it actually boils down to, when you just zoom out and look at the two types of business models, when you have uh, animals produced in the conventional way or you have plant-based or cell-based protein. Um, when, when it comes to the plant-based and the cell-based, here are a few of the advantages. You have healthier, more sustainable products, as we've been discussing, no animal welfare problems, no antibiotic use, more resource-efficient production, simpler, more secure supply chain, Gotta love that. It can be produced 24-7 close to growing urban areas. As you know, there's an increasing urbanization has been going on for many years. It can be scaled up sustainably and probably most importantly, there's a continuous development of the taste. I think when I've gone to a lot of conferences, people haven't tasted these products. They're like, yeah, but it's this meat substitute. It's sort of not beyond meat, it's below meat. But they keep improving the taste. A lot of it is already really good now. I was just at the Reducitarian Summit in LA last week. We had Ethan Brown from Beyond Meat talking about their huge lab, and they keep coming out with the Beyond Burger 2.0, 3.0, and they just keep improving where the sort of the status quo with cows and stuff. Yeah, you can give them a good back massage or really nice uh, grass from Estonian uh, highlands or whatever, but it's still not going to change significantly. But we can keep improving with, with these things. Um, Another interesting case for, for you investors, if there are any out there, this was 
um, the fastest growing food company in the world, due to a, f a, bird, out a f bird flu outbreak in the US, which cost uh, the US in six million dollars, um, so, so big billion dollars in export losses, because the supply chain break, broke down, they had to kill fi 50 million birds, and that meant McDonald's and a lot of these companies, such as uh, 7-Eleven and others, they couldn't get uh, eggs for their mail. You know, and where do they go get it? Then they bought it from these guys who are actually undercutting them with costs because they use plants instead of eggs. Tyson Foods, very much the same. Someone we worked with here, they switched over, one of the biggest and most known uh, meat companies in, in Europe and in Germany. And then probably most interesting, the consumer case. Um, this is unfortunately in German. Um, but the interesting part about this is you can see the market for plant-based is growing, right? But when you look at the people actually buying it, you have here, you have the vegetarian and, and vegan crowd, right? Which is like a little less than a third. Then the flexitarian crowd is, is by far the largest, but a bit, bit over a third. And then you have what they call al esa, which I'm not going to try and translate. It's not going to sound charming. But it means that there's actually, it's not the vegetarians and vegan pushing this, this agenda, right? even though there, it's a number that's growing, it's all the people in the middle there that had the combined purchasing power to push this market. And there's also a really interesting uh, demographic fact about this. When you look at the, the, uh, the sort of the curve going up in history, the baby boom generation was 1% vegetarian. Next of generation X was 4% vegetarian, and in the millennial, it's 12% vegetarian. So you can see it, it's going up this curve. That's just the vegetarian. So there's a spin-off of flexitarians because it's getting normalized. So that these are the future voters and the future consumers. So a lot of the big, big veggie boom that you're seeing now is actually millennials, such as me, who finished our philosophy, philosophy degrees and had, now have a lot of money to go out spending. Um, so it's kind of built in, in the future. I'm looking forward to seeing the statistics for the next generation. So this is basically the, the, what I called my talk here, the new frontier in the global foodscape. You can see all these. It's just growing across the board and just keep going up, also compared to the, the business model. So my final question to people out there in the food industry and others is uh, if the world's sort of protein portfolio is growing, then what, what will be your role going forward? Will it be as a benchmarker or as a bench warmer? So that was, that was it. Thank you so much. <laughs> so Thanks, David. Wonderful presentation. I've heard David talk a lot before in the ProVeg context, and he's always compelling and optimistic in the plant-based world where, honestly, there's a lot of doom and gloom, talking about factory farming, looming climate change. It's good to talk about business solutions. Um, so my perspective is also about the future. Um, in fact, I'm a social scientist who mostly researches historical social movements and technological changes to then apply them to the struggles humanity faces today and try and understand the most effective activism strategies, business strategies, tech strategies, etc. Um, so I work for a small think tank uh, doing this research, and I'm currently about to publish a book, actually within a month, on the end of animal farming that talks about all the things you've heard today. And in this presentation, I kind of want to go through some of the crucial forks in the road, or, or maybe reasons for optimism, um, in the coming decades. So not just thinking about how we can reduce Estonian consumption over the next year, how we can create more vegans or anything like that, but really where's the movement going in the long run. So you heard about this big change. Um, really, this is a, a reinvention of vegan food. You know, for the past few decades, vegans have been catering their products towards vegetarians, towards people who want local, organic, plant-centric food, and transitioning towards something like the Impossible Burger. Um, this is just a slide about the clean meat technology that you heard about earlier. I'm happy to answer any questions about that in Q&A. Um, then the biggest change we've had so far, I think, has been what David alluded to with a shift from focusing on individuals, so something like a go vegan message or go reducitarian or go vegetarian, but instead changing corporations or changing governments, broadly changing 
institutions, changing society as a whole, social norms. Um, you know, I'm a really big fan of, of groups like Open Cages and Anima and Invisible Animals, and their focus on trying to change society collectively. Um, I have a lot of evidence that I go through for this in the book about historical social movements and how it's been much more effective than individual change. So there's also a lot of momentum in the movement right now for farmed animals due to welfare reforms. So things like cage-free eggs, you know, making the meat that people do still eat um, more humane or more sustainable, et cetera. Um, and that generates a lot of momentum for the current trend towards plant-based food. So for example, reforms get coverage, you know, in the media, coverage from public figures, politicians, they get attention to all these animal issues. Um, similarly, they help form identities. So when a politician is talking to an advocacy group about cage-free eggs, and they vote yes on that, um, they've now cemented as a part of their platform, a part of their identity, a part of their public figure, um, that they care about farmed animals, and then they're more likely to support a plant-based initiative. There's a lot of evidence from social movements that I don't really have time to go into, but this kind of reform then abolish model is common throughout social change. And then finally, you of course just have increased prices. Um, I like being a social scientist in this field because I don't always have to talk about um, what farmed animal advocates are doing as being the best in all regards. Um, so you'll hear people who campaign for cage-free eggs say, oh, it'll be a very tiny price increase, or maybe it'll actually reduce costs. Um, I think it will increase costs, and I'm okay with that, um, because I think that will then generate a reduction in meat consumption and a transition towards plant-based foods, which, as you've heard, are getting cheaper and cheaper, and they'll kind of meet in the middle, and then you'll get price parity, and then the animal-free foods will be even cheaper. Uh, next, there are cyclical effects that are going to really come into play within the next five or ten years. Uh, so the first one is with the effect between welfare reforms and plant-based. Um, it also goes the other way around. As people are eating fewer animal products, they're then able to um, take more seriously those welfare considerations. And, you know, they're not eating as much meat, so they're not going to have as much of a price increase. And you get effects in both directions. Similarly, as you get more and more demand for these products, the prices decrease, um, so you're reaching economies of scale faster because you have the innovators, and you saw this in the diffusion of innovations curve earlier, the early adopters and the early majority um, helping these companies grow. And once they grow, they're able to reach price priority, which then allows more demographics to adopt these foods, and so on and so on. Um, there's also behavior and attitudes, so as people are no longer eating animal products, if that's because of something like they look more attractive, um, then they will start to care more about the environmental and animal issues. So one of my favorite psychology studies of all time is, is called Don't Mind Meat, and it's telling people that they're going to consume animal products, uh, beef jerky, and then seeing how that affects their perceptions of the mental capacities of animals. And if people know they're going to eat animal products, they then start to think they're basically cows are dumb. Um, and that's why you get a lot of culture these days thinking of you know, the cow staring blankly into the headlights um, because people are just eating animals and that makes them not want to care about them. There's also a big question of terminology and what do we call these products, especially the cell cultured meat that you've heard about today. Um, some of the terms that are ad favored by advocates focus on the effects of these technologies. So clean uh, in an homage to clean energy because of um, the ethical and food safety improvements compared to conventional meat. Uh, slaughter free. You know, we conducted a poll last year asking people in the U.S. whether they support a ban on slaughterhouses. Um, and in fact, this is quite surprising, but 47% of U.S. adults say they support a ban on slaughterhouses. Really just the word slaughter and the association with killing animals is so disturbing to people that if you call this something like slaughter-free meat, that's drawing attention to kind of the key moral crux in, in this issue. But you can also name it something based on the uh, method, the process. You could say cell-based, um, you could say cultured, though of course both of these have issues. So for example, all meat, all food um, is made from cells. Um, cultured implies fermentation in the food industry. You hear that for cultured milk is essentially yogurt. Um, it sounds like this is a you know, fermented meat product that you'd find at the Sydney Opera House or something. Um, and in fact, you see that if you use one of these first two terms or something similar, you get much, much more consumer acceptance. So I think this is kind of a fork in the road in the next decade for whether consumers start to adopt and get excited about these products. 
Another big question about terminology is what do we call in the long run? You know, which one of these terms will we settle on? Um, it will eventually just be called meat. It will become the new normal, as you've heard discussed. It'll be conventional meat. Um, so in some sense, this is kind of just what do we call it as consumers are getting used to it? How do we introduce it? And to me, as, as someone who's thinking about the broader social context, I think the most important factor is the ethical uh, environment. So I'm more in favor of terms like clean and slaughter free. Um, you also have to consider translations. So in Dutch, for example, the word clean meat sounds more like artificial or sanitized meat. It's pretty gross. Uh, whereas culture meat sounds like something more like going to the opera, and that might be more beneficial. Um, in Mandarin, in China, um, plant-based meat might be better called green meat, uh, which sounds really good in, in Chinese, but in English, green meat sounds like moldy meat or uh, meat that's been left out too long or something similar. Um, you also have to consider, will there be one perfect term? So some of the groups involved in this right now talk about, well, we have to search through these, brainstorm lists of you know, 50 or 100, and find the one that's perfect for all context. Um, I don't think that'll happen. I, I've been following this industry for quite a while now, and basically no new terms have come up. Maybe we'll be able to make up a term. So you think of something like a bio. You know, bio is, is from like a word like biological, but we could like shorten a word in that way. You think of name brands like Kleenex is the term for kind of all tissue, um, you know, facial tissue. Um, so we might have something like that. But in general, I think we're going to have this diversity of terms uh, for a while. Maybe we'll have one term for the regulatory context, uh, sort of like you have photovoltaic cells, um, which are more popularly known as solar cells and solar panels. Um, the last thing I want to go through is, is kind of case studies, what we can learn from historical technologies. So first, uh, genetically modified foods teaches us some important lessons about when consumers can really reject a new food technology. Um, first is the importance of ethics. So when GM foods were introduced, especially in Europe, uh, but all over the world, it was very much as a big business um, tool for increasing pof profits that was being put on unknowing consumers uh, without the consent or input of activists, of environmentalists, of health advocates. Um, this led to a lot of harm. So you'll hear some people in this field talk about uh, what really matters to consumers is price, taste, and convenience. And that's true to an extent. You know, for the animal rights activists in the room, I do think we need more of a focus on practicality. Um, but we shouldn't go so far in that direction that we suffer the same fate that GM Foods did. Uh, we still need to, this technology to be seen as a moral imperative, something we need as a society to tackle global issues like you know, animal suffering or incoming climate change. Um, that's really important for, for uh, confronting concerns like, oh, it's gross or it's unnatural. If you think about what's going to overcome those concerns, it's not just the individual interest. It's seeing it as a moral obligation. That's what allows people to overcome you know, so-called trivial concerns. Uh, we should also avoid minimal regulation. It's tempting to say we want these products on the market as soon as possible, and we should do whatever it takes to get them out as quickly as possible. Um, however, that can lead to a GM Foods-like situation where consumers are blindsided, essentially, um, and I don't want these foods to suffer that same fate. We can also go through an industry like biofuels, um, which teaches us about the danger of hype. Uh, so biofuels in the 2000s and early 2010s um, were extremely hyped as a solution to climate change, a solution to fossil fuels, um, so much so that when the technology didn't pan out, uh, whether that was for technical reasons or because of the choices of the industry, you saw a loss of investment, you saw a loss of media attention, and biofuels have, by and large today, become a much smaller field, a much less hyped field, uh, making specialty products. Uh, you also need a diversity of skill sets and methods, so biofuels also invested a lot in certain technical uh, pathways. So for something like cultured meat, where you have decisions like, do we use satellite cells you know, from muscle, or do we use a pluripotent stem cell, like something from the umbilical cord of an animal? That, um, these are two different technical pathways, and nobody really knows which one's going to work out. Uh, so we need to be trying different ones. We need mechanical engineers. We need cell biologists. We need every different skill set we might need to use, because we really just don't know exactly how the technology is going to pan out. So uh, I think there's a lot of reason for optimism, as I've discussed. Um, in fact, Pat Brown has predicted, so he's the founder of Impossible Foods, that his company, or at least uh, his company, will take the lead in displacing all meat by 2035. Um, Richard Branson uh, gave 2048 uh, for all meat. ProBeg has 50 by 40, as you've heard. Um, Greenpeace has 50% reduction in meat and dairy uh, by 2050. 
And then also people like journalist Ezra Klein, um, author Steven Pinker, science educator Bill Nye, Indian politician Maneka Gandhi, and conservative columnist Charles Krauthammer have all predicted the end of animal farming, and many more uh, intellectuals. In fact, they've went so far as to say that uh, our descendants, you know, 100 years from now, will look back on the use of animals for food as a moral atrocity. Um, and I think this is compelling because many of these people are, certainly aren't vegan themselves, but some of them aren't even animal rights activists. They're just intellectuals who are thinking critically about the issue and see the writing on the wall. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail on this, but this is the longer presentation I've been giving in Europe recently. Um, it's a roadmap for concretely what change we might see based on those social movements and technologies over the next 10, 20, 100 years. Um, and I do think by the end of the century, uh, there will be no more animal products that come from animals. Everything will either be plant-based or cell-based um, or, of course, from whole plant-based sources. So, thank you. Can we leave up this slide during our q and <laughs> It's too late. Actually, when that came up, I, I should be, what, what we're also selling is the new food conference from ProVet in March. I have some flyers, so please come talk about it with me afterwards. Yeah. And then I also know that my, my friend Kari is sitting down there and was a bit disappointed he wasn't mentioned on your slide of intellectuals who is um, predicting animal farming, but What's you can talk, talk it out yeah. afterwards. Um, well, one question I have for you, I think we're, yeah, I have one question at least, and maybe we could open it up after. So this was a shorter presentation, obviously, yet you talked a lot about the name of clean meat. It seems clean meat, cellular agriculture will play a huge role in, in your perspective. Yet you talked a lot about, about the individuals or consumer acceptance. Do we want to eat it when it's on our plate? But getting it to our plate. There's a lot of institutional focus mm -hmm. and work to be done. So, for example, the regulatory framework, you didn't discuss too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are a lot of debates already about the various regulatory pathways that this tech can go through. Um, in the United States, we've had the most advanced or, or publicized debate between the Food and Drug Administration and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, two food regulatory agencies, because the USDA regulates meat and eggs, um, but the FDA has been in charge of most bioengineering and kind of laboratory-grown foods. Um, so from, from the advocate's perspective, most people are wanting the FDA to have more control because they have a mandate just to protect consumer safety which of course everyone is on board with. Whereas the USDA is, is very close to the animal agriculture industry. Um, there are lots of documents that have been exposed showing really deep connections between them. So you might worry that in certain regulatory pathways, um, the factory farming industry could essentially quash this industry um, before it has a chance to get going. Uh, but fortunately, this is a reason for optimism because so far the FDA has taken more of a role. In fact, I believe just, just today, or sorry, yesterday in the United States, um, Sonny Perdue of, of the USDA um, suggested that he wants a streamlined uh, regulatory framework so that producers don't uh, go overseas to, to sell these first products or to produce them um, because obviously the US wants to be the home of innovation, much like Tallinn, um, and that's encouraging governments to get more on board. Yeah. Okay, so you're optimistic about their, them getting on board? I am, I mean, it's still a lot of uncertainty, but so far there's cause for optimism. Okay. Uh, so a question I had for you before we open it up, um, thinking about the future of, of plant-based foods, we're obviously all excited about it, we've seen lots of signs of growth, uh, but in terms of animal agriculture, I don't know, do you agree with me that there might be an end to animal farming, or do you think it's going to be a reduction, a shift towards humane foods, what is the future of animal-based animal products? That's a good question, and just so you know, we, we planned the questions, so there's nothing <laughs> there. Um, Looking at it from, from a business perspective, um, when, when you just zoom out, we're gonna, we're seven billion people, we're gonna be, to 2050, we're gonna be around 10, nine. The calorie conversion of, of taking uh, a cow or chicken or whatever animal it is, you, you can't produce enough. They require too much land, you know? So if you didn't think, okay, if we intensify, if we, if we increase efficiency, the output of animal protein, that means we have to intensify. That means we're not going to have them grazing around the Estonian highlands or this, this focus on organic meat and better, more humane slaughter, all that, because mm -hmm. that's not efficient enough. So, but even with the efficiency, we can't create enough protein from an animal-based source. And the more you can find them, the more intensive and effective you get, 
the more you use uh, antibiotics, can you, you pour them together. And I didn't get too much into it, it was discussed after uh, and early as well. Scientists say it's like, it's a train wreck in slow motion when it comes to antibiotics. Huge, yeah, just Google it. Um, so, so that will come up as well, of course. Um, and then if you, if you um, increase motivation, and you, let's say we have a regulatory framework, subsidies, pouring more money into, and we, we intensify the farming, making it more productive. Mm -hmm. Of course, from a, the, the logic of the market will say, okay, if, if I'm not a pig farmer myself yet, then I want to become it. I'm incentivized towards it because it's more lucrative in the short run at least, right? Yeah. And the ones already producing, they will start increasing their, their farm production, increasing all these problems that are their subsidy of it. So, so just from the pure business case, it's just not possible unless we yeah, heavily genetically modify the cows, but in some way you could say um, that what, what, what clean meat has also been called is the second domestication. Mm -hmm. You know, the first one was when we started farming animals, um, and now we're actually farming on the cells themselves, you know, we're not even used to that. I would say that's the ultimate efficiency we can get when it comes to animal products. So there's not really anything beating that. Yeah, so something we touched on earlier when we were just talking personally um, was this kind of business angle versus my like social, maybe more moral angle. Um, and I'm curious for you to kind of make the case for, for this business approach, focusing on efficiency, talking to people about bottom lines. Um, like, do you think that's gonna be essential for change or what role do you see for moral arguments? Yeah, okay, that's a, well, <laughs> in front of you guys, you all seem a bit moral, so I don't know if, um, <laughs> I, it's my impression when I've gotten given this talk, I've given it across the board uh, to more uh, right-wing parties and more liberal and free market. Uh, I've also d given a training, uh, veggie training, vegetarian training course for the Copenhagen Association of Butchers, which was really interesting. They're getting more and more uh, demand for plant-based in their catering. And when you're just looking at the bottom line and they could see this curve growing up of potential customers, mm -hmm. that got them on board, no questions asked. So I'd, I would make some case, at least in a corporate context, when you're trying to, to pitch a business idea, that uh, they're, they're just saying, you know, our, our actions uh, come first, mm -hmm. and then our attitudes, they follow suit, right? Um, I think that's a large, to a large degree, if we can find whatever incentivizes the shift before uh, World War III breaks out over resources, because then we're going to make the shift anyway. So, so I'm thinking, it's, yeah, it seems like it's a... In a corporate setting, that's what they listen to hmm. quite a lot, if you can tie it up with other types of values. Yeah, I mean, I think it speaks to something in, in broader social change where every movement needs so-called radical flanks, um, people who are pushing the moral conversation, who are doing things like criticizing cage-free eggs, you know, saying, oh, there's still so much suffering, so much environmental destruction, or even if there's like a 10% reduction in plant-based, or let's say a meatless Monday. Somebody who's like pushing that moral angle and saying, no, we need to go farther. Um, but of course we need moderate flanks or even a moderate mass of the movement that's doing things like talking to corporations. Um, and yeah, I think we're, we're largely filling maybe two different roles in this change, or at least like examining two different roles. But I think we're overall agreeing what the whole picture should look like. You know, there's, there should be a breakdown of people, of, of some moderates, some radicals. And then I think as effective uh, business leaders and advocates, we should take a look at the current kind of distribution and say, where can we fit? Um, this comes up so much in farm down advocacy. So for example, with new business ideas, if um, you see these uh, culture meat companies that are producing you know, beef or pork, um, but then you say something like, oh, actually um, chicken meat, because it doesn't have vasculature, could be technically much more easy, um, then you might wanna work on that. Or even fish meat, which is actually easier than chicken meat because it can be kept at room temperature, um, the cells proliferate more easily, and overall you could be the first one to market just by taking a neglected route. So yeah, there's, a, there's room for everyone, I think, in the yeah. movement. Yeah. Do you want to open it up? Yeah, uh, any questions, or did we answer all of it? So I know one answer to this. Um, so, I mean, the short answer is we're not sure exactly, and if you're an economist in the room, like, please work on this and get us better estimates. Um, but the one study that's been done looked at um, chicken subsidies, so all the subsidies involved in the production of chicken meat in the US, 
and estimated that you would only have a 1% re uh, increase in price if you got rid of all subsidies. And I mean, subsidies are, are, have been really powerful and talked about a lot by vegan and plant-based advocates. Um, they're an important talking point because people are so opposed to government waste and subsidies for unethical things. Um, but I'm not sure how much of a concrete difference it would make. In fact, when I talk to a lot of people who are working on political issues, especially in a place like Northern Europe, I encourage them to get their governments to do something like invest in the plant-based food. You know, we heard earlier about three different governments, uh, Singapore, Japan, and Israel, that have invested in this new technology. And that's an area where if you you pump in, let's say, $10 million, that's like a huge increase in just the total size of, of something like the cultured meat industry. Um, whereas subsidies are you know, billions of dollars and might not make as big of a difference. So in general, I'm not sure we should be as focused on them in our actual actions, even if they make a really good talking point. Yeah, to, to add on that, because yeah, that makes, makes sense. I would think there, there are other pathways to the market for the plant base where the, the space is being handicapped a bit. So the, for example, value added tax on plant milk in Germany, it's 17%, which is the across the board value added tax on most items, yet on cow's milk, it's 6%. So that's kind of unfair, even from a very liberal market standpoint, right? Um, so one thing is, is talking about subsidies, but I, I would agree that the fastest way to get to a point where we can effectively talk about subsidies, not just in our little vegan club in the woods, that would be um, scaling up these other types of economy and showing that there's growth rates to be had. There's way more market uh, job opportunities opening up. Mm -hmm. Also relating to, to subsidies themselves, there are what we call uh, externalities, so things that are not included in the price. Um, so yeah, as you know, we mentioned uh, climate change, we mentioned health, uh, you can save a lot, there's been good studies done on public health spending if we would decrease our consumption of animal-based products. And who's paying these prices on these? Let's say with climate change, we're basically, because we have such a low price on animal-based products, and we take this check and we're like, okay, nobody's looking, and we throw it into the children's room, right? So they can pay it when they grow up. It's like a little savings for them, right? So, so I think that's also a hard thing to take up in the political context, but there's more and more pressure accumulating, and it's not gonna go away because um, it's just going to keep increasing awareness of these problems, especially as, as it intensifies and, and if meat production grows and we're going to be more people on the planet. So I think at a certain point it will be smart to start having this discussion, but I think at a later, later date when we have a very solid business case where we can go get governments on board, like he mentioned a few good cases of. Questions, comments, complaints? other estimates for the end of factory farming? Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, well, we discussed this earlier, is the global context, and, and we've both been around the world and thinking about what countries have the most exciting change. Is there anything you want to highlight? Yes, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so, um, yeah, actually, when you zoom out a bit, because I mentioned that the sort of individual best business case, if we, we take subsidies and other externalities aside, then it's just smarter taking the animal out, right? Um, so there's, there's actually a lot of movement in this space. Uh, when I gave this similar presentation at the, and there's someone from the Danish government there and they're hosting this big World Food Summit and I lobbied for them to have more plant-based options and I, I ended with this last quote, uh, what will be Denmark's role? Are we benchmarking or are we sitting warming the bench on the sidelines, right? Mm -hmm. And I could see like the, yeah, uh, her pulse going up and like what are we actually doing in Denmark and I could only mention like one good company at that time mm. So it seems like it's something that's incentivizing them to think what can we do as because Denmark is very green and all that um, That's a lot of our food brand at least So so I think when in a global context when you talk into that So when you look at what the cool kids are doing we mentioned uh, you mentioned the Silicon Valley sector in Israel and France also invested uh, 2016 mm. 1 billion euros into the alternative protein space and seeking market leadership in that space. And also focus on, because it's the government level at it, focusing on creating a lot more uh, job opportunities in that space. So I think that's a very progressive way of looking at it. And like you mentioned, China invested $300 million in it. Canada is doing really good on lentils and pulses. So I think bringing this together to each other, it's kind of like the, the same psychology of uh, the USSR and the, the, mm -hmm. 
free thinking uh, yeah country of America that um, where where who gets to the moon first right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah you see this a lot throughout social movements so in the 1960s in civil rights for example actually 1950s people don't realize this but one of the biggest arguments in Brown versus Board of Education which is like the big court case to combat segregation in the U S one of the biggest arguments was um, the commies are like uh, trash talking us in the global dialogue because we have segregation and yet we're talking about being the country of freedom. And like this was the argument that the US government made or submitted in like a memo to that court case. So really just any like, I don't wanna say arms race because that implies weapons and harm, um, but the positive version of that is starting to happen in this. And with these like global and cultural identities like Tolin or, or Silicon Valley, that's hugely powerful. Yeah, well, I think uh, military metaphors work in certain contexts. Um, yeah, to, to add to that, an interesting example, example from, from a, a different sphere in, in climate change. In, in the 90s, you already had the blueprint for electrical cars. General Motors uh, rolled it out in the US highways with a little group that could get to try and test these cars. They're really happy about them, but they had to return them due to the contract. It was just a test drive. And then nothing happened, basically fast forward till now, because they didn't, General Motors was not incentivized to bring them out into market. But in China, where they take um, Mormon, uh, what would that be? Like more unanimous uh, yeah. political decisions. They, they're not seeing that they're the fastest, biggest growing producer of, of uh, clean energy cars. And you're seeing clean energy cars driving around on the US highways, I think. This may, might be a rumor, you might know better, but this, the Make it America Great Again, the, the cap that everybody was, well, not everybody, some were wearing during the elections. If you opened it up, it said made in China. I don't know if that's just a rumor, but I don't know. I'm just thinking when you can pivot these um, big market forces against each other, there's a, some magic happens. Yeah. 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 Do you have more questions? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hey, thank you for this nice discussion. Um, I just wanted to ask, like when you said that uh, this, you, that it's very clear how different generations uh, have like um, more vegans and vegetarians. Do you also see like uh, the reasons uh, for like uh, adopting a plant-based diet uh, changing, or do people have like different uh, like? Is the reason why they're doing it changing as well, or has it always been the same? Do you have some? You wrote the book on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know good data on different generations, so the issue is that you have to either do surveys uh, year after year, even decade after decade, or you're just kind of assuming that differences in age are differences in generations. But for age, certainly, older people are more motivated by the health conditions that are actually affecting them. They're not into climate change and these kind of newer issues or even animal suffering. Um, so you get more discussion of just like, oh, like people who Google, how do I uh, stop heart disease or something, and then come across plant-based physicians um, for that sort of reason. Um, yeah. Do you know data? Uh, not necessarily data, but I have heard market researchers talk about how young people, in a very uh, bit of a paradox, they don't like labels, yet they also like labels. Like they don't like calling themselves vegetarians, vegans, but nobody gets out and gets like the flexitarian to two or something like that, <laughs> right? So there's, they, they, but they also don't want to be committed to what their parents were doing, right? So there's, there's some identity drive. Um, yet they also like to be able to dabble in everything. Yeah, um, I, would, I would add one thing on the ethics and business angle, which is that when you survey the leaders of kind of plant-based food right now, so people who are starting these companies who I profiled in the book or the leaders of the big plant-based organizations, most of them are motivated by either the animal suffering, they're like pretty hardcore like vegan abolitionists, um, or the very urgent climate change issues. It's not just environmentalism, not just pollution, but this like moral issue of climate change. And I think this speaks a lot to what motivates people to not just change their own diet, like, I'm sure I can talk about heart disease and get a lot of, you know, 60-year-old men to, to convert to vegan diets, but if I want to create a generation of entrepreneurs and leaders and activists, I might want to go for a morally urgent issue that evokes, you know, what I would call moral outrage um, and really gets people working to change society as a whole, to take to the streets, to become uh, really global changers. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I focus more on ethics, at least in a public context, even though I agree in the boardroom, business stuff makes more sense. 
there might have been a question there from the lady owning a really nice vegan restaurant in downtown. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thirst. Um, no questions, but I'm just like torn at the moment because this all sounds so super. Uh, all these things being developed and all these things being discussed and so on. So I'm like at the moment feeling again that do we live in a vegan bubble or is it actually happening? And we're even having like companies in Estonia developing this kind of cool things and trying to no, out of soya and everything, but at the same time, Estonia, I'm, I'm not sure if it's governmental, but basically they are trying to make a soya bean that grows in Estonia, but their goal is to feed it to cows at the same time. So I'm just torn, but it's all good that we are here and do the things we do at the same time. So thank you. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a scientist, I'm always trying to get out of my bubble. Um, I'm trying to engage with people like those public intellectuals I talked about. And in general, I'm not too focused on like what people are doing today. I mean, if I have like Google News alerts, which are great, and, and show you the latest discussions of veganism or plant-based, but so many of those are the latest celebrity or they're like top 10 reasons to go vegan or a famous YouTuber has went vegan. But then you also see so many articles that say, you know, a celebrity has stopped going vegan or this YouTuber now, I think Logan Paul was like the most recent one to, to stop being vegan and a huge amount of outrage. And there are a lot of like trends and I think those are kind of just kind of noise and I don't worry as much about them. In fact, I'm much more focused on things like the efficiency arguments and just the fact that out of our own self-interest, uh, especially for something like climate change, but even if we just want more outputs per unit input um, just to save money or whatever, we still need to shift towards animal-free foods. And like that's a long-term driver. Or a lot of what I research at Sentience Institute is the expanding moral circle and just how reliably decade after decade and century after century, we incorporate more sentient beings uh, mostly humans, but now increasingly animals used in entertainment or animals used in fur um, into our moral circle. And these long-term trends are what gives me reason for optimism, not what I'm seeing in, in my social circles, not what I'm seeing on the news, um, instead these deeper currents. So I have a, quite a messy thought because I just came to it, but I was thinking that when we are talking about plant-based uh, future or clean meat, then we want, to, we want it to be sustainable. But I think the question is right now that why we want to convert to plant-based and clean meat is that we just can't uh, feed the world. We, can't, we have so much need for food uh, in general. So how do you think it would be like a good way to appro uh, approach it as uh, is clean make good because we can consume as, as much as we are doing right now and we can continue doing and even consuming more, which means that the health benefit kind of like goes away from the, from the or, we sh or we should approach it more that we should reduce our meat consumption anyway and be more healthier because right now I'm thinking that in the business aspect anyway, because businesses want the, uh, their product to sell well, so they want to sell it a lot. So therefore I think when clean meat and, the, and it's slaughter free, the animal, animals are well, everything is great, people are gonna consume maybe even more food. So I think maybe we're gonna get sicker as humans. Animals will be happy, but I think maybe it's the welfare issue of humans then. So what's your ideas on that? Yeah, well, I can start with the comment. I saw one of statistics I read is the, the least sustainable thing is uh, human living. So the longer we live, the less sustainable it is. So I don't really see uh, an issue. No, but um, no, seriously, I think it's, it's, a, good, it's, a, good, uh, it's a good point yet. Um, when you look at the resource cost going into it right at the moment, right, and these 10 million people knocking on our door and quite soon. So we, we can't get to that point in the way we are, right? So that's going to shift and clean meat, you can, or shell base, you can actually, um, you, can, you can process it in such a way that there's reduced cost of some of the, the health risks associated with it. So I think, um, yeah, we can scale it up until the lifeboat gets filled again, right? But let, we can burn that bridge when we get there. 
Yeah, I think there are going to be a lot of steps in this process. And I mean, in the very long term, I think we're all going to live in space and eat like algae or does, does anyone drink Soylent or Joylent or Huel? So these are like powdered food. They're like entire meal replacements. They're not made from any whole ingredients. Instead, it's like just the fat, just the vitamin, just the sulfur, all of the things that you would find in real food. Um, and like this is kind of the, the, the final result. And maybe we'll all be pumped up to, to, to computers in a way that like makes us simulate the experience of food or something. So like in the long run, I mean, a, a moderate step there is like things that come from photosynthesis, like the most efficient thing we have around today. Um, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll out of self-interest, um, burn lots of bridges, but then cross many as well, um, getting to this final result. Um, and I just think right now there's so much urgency around the animal suffering and around global climate change that like we need the thing that works and the thing that works is sophisticated plant-based or clean meat. Nice conclusion. Oh. <laughs> All right, one more question regarding the kind of large scale social change. So that relates to the bubble uh, discussion also. And, and I guess kind of the, the problem of change is that it creates a lot of anxiety, especially in the social groups that kind of feel left behind, right? So what you're talking and what you're advocating is really advanced, right? So. It's, it's technical, it requires a certain level of understanding to kind of come along with it. But as we see during recent decades, the kind of uh, divide in the societies and kind of, how would I say, antagonism or sort of split between uh, different kind of strata of society has become much, much bigger. Uh, in the United States, you have a new president who He's a very nice man, but you know he has some, uh, you know, some of his some of his preferences are not in accordance with your vision of the future, right? So, and that's because a large part of the uh, United States society just feels left behind from this advancement. And and kind of my question is how to make it stable, right? How the how the change that is so rapid nowadays, you know, how that can uh, kind of be a stable thing so that everybody is included. Have you thought about that? Is that part of the agenda of the uh, Sentience Institute? Yeah, I mean, I go back to this point about ethics, and I, I hate to harp on this, but um, I think it's so important that we don't just in suffering today, whether that's caused by climate change or animals or human health, but that we expand humanity's moral circle. And it's one of the reasons I'm so glad that the leaders of these companies are often very ethics-minded people. I mean, there's of course self-interest. Everyone wants to run the next new business, go down in the history books, make profits, etc. But you have companies like Just, um, that one of their products is, I don't remember the country, but, but some country in Africa, they're providing like a nutritional plant-based uh, porridge, essentially, um, to, to like feed the global poor. Um, and so many of them are incorporating this you know, in their long-term goals. They want to really get costs down. They want to have global distribution. And I'm very thankful for this. I mean, it's, again, an important reason to have radical flanks, to have people like uh, th those in this room who are asking these critical questions, and we'll keep pushing. Because if we get to the point where, for example, just due to health reasons, we stop eating animal products, maybe we don't switch to clean meat, then switch to plant-based, um, but we haven't had the moral momentum involved, we might be in a really dangerous situation where we're not tackling those more fundamental issues. And it's why it's so important to have uh, a concern for not just the people suffering today, but the people suffering in the long run. So I have a broader question that maybe you two are fit to answer. So what, what would you, your advice be to the younger animal activists who feel really passionate about uh, actually making a change? Um, should they become, I, I think, food engineers, lawyers and entrepreneurs? And this is a way to make a change? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, always like get a suit and get a haircut. Is not what you say. <laughs> uh, it doesn't have to be that extreme, of course. Um, I think uh, this is also speaking from no statistic at all. But I think uh, there's the saying: whatever you are very passionate about is what you become really good at. Of course, it's smart looking ahead and the roadblocks and. Um, there's things you shouldn't be passionate about, of course, um, but like there's room for everything in this comp in this whole, let's call it a movement, so to speak. There's room for so many things. 
Uh, I would start reading up on a lot of the effects of altruism and, and these, uh, there's the 80,000 hours career guide online um, about how to make an impact where it aligns really much with your own sweet spot of passion. That's where you get your own fuel. So that needs to be thought into sustainable activism as well. Um, I, I love going and giving presentations to business people, for example, really, yeah. Um, so, so if that drive is in there and you then find whatever and you work on those skills, I don't think it's hard to go wrong. Yeah, I'd say if you have a background or an interest in cell biology or mechanical engineering or any of the, the technical things that have been talked about today, going into those, starting a business, working for one of these businesses, probably the top choice. Um, if you're like me and more of a social person and the nonprofit realm suits you, um, I'd encourage you to either work with a group like Invisible Animals or Anima or Open Cages, who's doing a lot of institutional change, like that uh, Meatless Tuesday thing that was talked about, um, or the, the, the welfare reforms like Cage Free Eggs. These are all very important, um, or to work with organizations that are working on the social aspect of food technology. So from the effect of autism perspective, trying to do as much good as possible, um, people think technology is going to be very important, but it's also not as neglected as social change. So there are tons of people who just out of their own self-interest want to invest in these companies, found them, make lots of money, that sort of thing. Um, but if you're working for a group like Good Food Institute, that's or ProVeg, that's incubating companies, that's um, working on regulations, that's working on marketing and making sure that this like untamed, huge, chaotic uh, industry is going in the right direction in the long term. That's like a crucial lever that we can push on to steer the future in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, JC and David. Okay. Yeah. No, thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you.